Welcome to the Real Estate Syndication Show. Whether you are a seasoned investor or building a new real estate business, this is the show for you. Whitney Sewell talks to top experts in the business. Our goal is to help you master real estate syndication. And now your host, Whitney Sewell. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Whitney Sewell. Today, our guest is John Simcoe. Thanks for being on the show, John. Thanks for having me on the show, Whitney. John has raised over $30 million of private capital for real estate projects. He's performed over 150 rent-to-owns. He's also a black belt in Taekwondo. Thanks for being on the show again, John. And give us a little bit of your background, how you got in real estate and uh, how long, and, and just tell us about that process a little bit. Sure thing, Whitney. Uh, well, I very first got started when I used to have a Taekwondo business and a partner in it. And his parents were very entrepreneurial and they gave us an idea to, to go buy a piece of property together and rent it out. And at the time I was a college student, so I, I didn't have the extra, extra capital for a down payment. And so I had to, had to figure it out. And with that very first uh, time that I got out of college, I paid off all my student debts really quick. I still had no money, but uh, a different friend ended up coming along and, uh, and he had a down payment and I could get a mortgage. And so we got our very first rental property just like that. And I, I used none of, none of my own money to, to get it. We, I used, used my friend who I partnered with on it. And that was, that was when I was 23 years old. So it, you know, a lot younger than I am now, but, uh, you know, I still remember it like it was yesterday. And so I got, you know, we, we were generating money on that. We could pay the debt that we had, we'd used to be able to buy it like that first mortgage, our taxes, our insurance, and we were making about $400 a month each. And so it wasn't super huge. Uh, but three years later, the market had done quite a lot better where that house was. And so we ended up selling it and, and did what every 26 year old guy does. We went and bought Porsches and Dodge Vipers <laughs> <laughs> with, our, with our money from the first deal. And so a, bi a big giant light bulb went off. And, uh, and so I said, you know, I've got to be able to do some more of this. And so I spent a lot of time studying and learning uh, more and more about, about real estate and different strategies that I could use. And, uh, and, you know, I've never made such an extravagant purchase ever again, <laughs> but, uh, and still have the car, a lot of, lot of joy. <laughs> uh, but at the same time, uh, I went on to start doing a few more deals in a year and then a few more until I, I was able to start doing one every kind of three or four days. And I really had this little machine built out, which was going quite quickly for, for a while. And, uh, and I've slowed it down a little bit right now to, to make sure that there's good quality in check. But at the same time, I need to find these, these real estate opportunities where there can be a profit that we can make. And I have to be able to finance them in some type of fashion. And so I do that in, in quite a few number of ways, but it usually means sitting down and meeting someone who I'm going to be asking for some money. That's funny. You bought Porsches and Vipers. That is whatever 25 or six year old does. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> if they had the money, if they came into the market, must have done really good there. Well, it 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 actually did really good. Um, uh, it was just a, a, like a fairly steady increase, and and we ended up selling the property to another investor, and the same renters were there for the three years plus I think another seven more or six more every every so often I run into her and ask her how that property's. <laughs> You know, were you happy that you bought that from me? Kind of, kind of check. And she says, oh yeah, same people. I'm pretty sure it's changed now, but uh, I think those people stayed there for like nine or 10 years as her renters, the same, the same ones that we found originally. Wow. So, yeah. you know, getting started when you did, tell us about, you know, how you started raising money, you know, so you were just getting started and you just maybe had, you know, the one home or two, tell us that process, how, how you had confidence to do that and what that looked like. So while uh, well, it didn't happen easily at first, and so at the very beginning, I uh, I'd taken some study courses. I decided I would do these rent-to-own deals, uh, which I which I've done a lot of. That's not not the only thing I do, but often selling a property that way generates a little better profits in, in per per house or per transaction. It, it works out really well, and so. 
Uh, but and so I'd still need to buy them and, and get them. And so I, I decided I would do that more. And so I, I my sister was getting married one summer and I drove all the way to, to Winnipeg, which is in central central Canada. So it's it's a good 17 or 18 hours of driving for me to get there. And I, I go there and I'm going to spend a couple of weeks. I have two weeks of holidays. I still have a job at this point. I'm not quite full time. Uh, you know, this is, you know, during those developing years. And I thought I could approach, uh, I, I'd set up appointments with my friends, my families, their parents. I think I was about, probably about 26 or 27 at the time. And, and I had 50 appointments set up during these two weeks and I was going to pitch this rent own deal. Uh, I already had an offer on a property and I didn't have enough money to be able to buy it. And so that, that created a little bit of like need. Uh, I don't necessarily recommend doing that, but that, that was the situation I was in. I needed to find some money to, to buy this house because I had promised it to a family that I would, would let them do rent to own on it. And, uh, and so I made up these glossy brochures and I put all kinds of market data about the property. And, uh, you know, I crammed these folders full of, full of info and I went and met with all 50 of those people. I tried pitching my deals. They knew that's what I was there for. Uh, and at the end of it, I ended up having to drive back to my hometown and not a single person had said yes to me. And, and so I, I literally completely failed and spent my entire holiday with no capital raised. <laughs> like there was every day except for the wedding and a little bit of help preparing for the wedding to help out my sister my time was in these meetings back to back and driving around and, and, and trying to, trying to go to my inner circle, the people I know most. Uh, and so I drove back and I felt a little bit in despair because I'd really given my word to this family that I'd, I'd get them this house. And so I didn't stop. I kept, I kept approaching more and more people and eventually, uh, you know, had a meeting in a coffee shop and, a woman said yes, and so my confidence grew. Uh, and then another guy said yes, and another friend of mine said yes, and and I had the rest of the money myself. So I said, great, at least now now the pressure's off, and at least I can get this family this house. And so that worked out. Two years went by, the house was sold, paid everybody back, they made a good return on it, uh, and at the same time, I got my own money back. And, and uh, word had got out that I was doing a little bit of this and, and setting it up. And so some people started coming to me and I kept doing these presentations and meeting with them. I kept having these fairly structured one hour long coffee meetings. Uh, and, and by the end of the meeting, I'd either find out if they're going to do my deal with me or not. Right. And, and I just started doing more of that. And I started doing a little bit of teaching where I would teach people some fundamentals about, about how, how, you know, mortgage lending works. Cause that's, that's ultimately what I'm, I'm convincing most of them that, you know, their money can be safe and secure by with real estate behind it. And so, you know, it's secured by a real tangible asset. And so a lot of people really like that. And so if they want just a very secure return uh, and, and, and a bit higher, we're using it for, for investment projects. So, you know, it's, it's, they're doing better than what they're getting at the banks. And so people are very happy with that. And when they, when they learn those things, they typically want to do these deals with me. And, and it just starts, it starts attracting itself the more and more. And now it, now I get, I get contacted cold, uh, by, by people who know that this is what I do, uh, as well as we're constantly, every time these, these deals complete, we're constantly paying back the people who started with us. And so when that goes around, people tell their friends, they got, you know, all their money back and everything they were promised. And, and then after that, you know, their friends, you know, bring people. And so, so word gets around pretty quickly when, when people are very happy with what you're, you're doing for them. Sure. Sure. So let's, let's break that down a little bit. I, I like how well, you had said you wouldn't recommend what having a property before you've, you've raised a little capital or before you have some people lined up. However, would you say you would have been able to raise the capital or you would have been that determined if you hadn't had that deal already? Uh, what was that? Sorry. 
if you if you hadn't already had those people depending on you or waiting on you that know, you'd kind of already promised about having that that property you think you would have still been as determined to have 50 people lined up and made that trip and all those appointments well i i had decided i was going to do it um it's kind of like jump burning the bridge behind you yeah uh you don't get like I, I had to do it. And even, even after that tremendous kind of failure, and I took a long time thinking about my approach, how I talked about it. I mean, truthfully, I confused the crap out of people. And, and when they can't understand something, they're not going to do it. They're not going to lend their money to it. Uh, even if they trust you or they think you're a good guy, uh, you know, it, uh, it really makes a difference in, in how you approach it and, and even a level of professionalism. So what was kind of nice by going one circle outside, I got the people who didn't necessarily know me as much when I was a young kid or a teenager uh, or having done a few dumb things over the years. So it's kind of nice having a little bit of a fresh start that way. Are you tired of answering emails from investors about when they'll receive their K-1s? Let the real estate CPA handle the accounting and taxes on your next syndication, and they'll file your tax returns by March 15th so you can get your K-1s to your investors by the individual filing deadline on April 15th. Not only will this reduce headaches, but it will help you retain investors over the long term by improving investor experience. The Real Estate CPA is now offering a special virtual workshop to the listeners of the Real Estate Syndication Show on how to answer tax-related questions from your investors. Learn more today by visiting therealestatecpa.com forward slash syndication. Yeah. So, you know, it sounds like, you know, you went around to the 50 people, you made those appointments, and then, you know, you, you got rejected a bunch, but you got a lot of practice right? You know, and then you started having more appointments and then all of a sudden the lady in the coffee shop said yes. What, what do you think changed from all those 50 appointments to the woman in the coffee shop and then to the few more that said yes? I think a little, a little bit of a confidence and, and really, you know, a good long 17 hour drive where all you can do is really think a bit. Um, I called people, I, I asked a few people, who I knew had been doing a little bit of capital raising. And, uh, and at the end of the day, I, I found that what I really didn't need was those big glossy brochures and fan, you know, like uh, trying to imitate maybe a bigger, a bigger company of that sort. Whereas, you know, I'm just, I'm just a, a guy and I'm, I'm doing, doing a real estate deal here. Um, and like the thing with all my people is that they can call me whenever they want. If they want an update on something, they they're dealing directly with me. So I found that losing some of those, some of those fancy brochures was a really good idea, but don't lose the professionalism. You still need to to look the part, act the part, uh, have business cards that say what you're going to do, uh, dr dress appropriately for, for the meeting, you know, and, and every location like East to West, all over Canada, all over the United States, that's going to be a little different for how you should dress. You know, some places are totally, you need a suit and tie. Other places, uh, you know, something very much like if you can see what we're wearing right now, what you're wearing would be perfect to go meet with someone in a coffee shop, what, you know, with your little collar on your shirt and a, and a, and a you know, a simple pattern. It's non-offensive. Same thing with mine. I got a very plain sweater on today. And, uh, and so this is the perfect, perfect way to go and, you know, clean appearance, clean shaven. Uh, and that's the perfect way to at least uh, appear for a lot of these, for a lot of people, you know, you don't always need to overdress. And so that's an important part because you can really intimidate some people too. Uh, some of the people that I'll go meet, these are, these are their life savings or lots of them or, or a good component. Many of them work very hard for their money. Um, they work jobs, they work overtime, they, they do what they need to do and, and they get to take part in a little piece of a deal at a time. And sometimes that, that's enough to, to motivate them to want to do more in the future. So tell us, you know, what has changed, you know, from then to maybe now, what would you tell yourself knowing what you know now, tell yourself back then that, that you wish you'd have known them? 
probably to relax a little more um, as well as focus on what's in it for them and, and how they, how they make their money. I, you know, I, I cover a couple of these topics on my YouTube show, uh, like the how to dress, but also how, how to pitch an idea to someone. And really at the end of the day, they need to keep it simple. And so I call it kiss pitching. You can, you can type that in your YouTube. You'll probably find it. Um, and anyways, it just ultimately means that, you know, what are they putting in? What are they getting out? How long? A little bit, a couple of fundamentals about the, you know, the property, the asset that we're, we're using as collateral, just so that they're aware of, you know, how, how leveraged it is. Uh, what is it worth? Uh, what is the future plan with it? You know, and if they're okay with all those things, then they're going to want to say yes, especially if they trust that you'll be able to run the project smoothly and, and deliver on it. So you mentioned you started doing uh, presentations and what would that look like and what was your audience? Um, well, at first I started a little meetup on meetup.com and at that meetup, I would, uh, I would play the cash flow one-on-one game. That's a Robert Kiyosaki, rich dad, poor dad game. I'm, pretty sure your listeners are probably familiar with that. Uh, but I would go and I would play that game. I would have a couple game boards and I would usually teach about a 20 minute, maybe 15, 20, uh, try and facilitate some discussion around the table about something that's going on in the real estate world or the market or, or teach a type of lending, anything that I could. Uh, and that got me a lot of practice in front of people. I'd, I'd overcome my stage fright from doing, from teaching martial arts. Cause I, I was a shy boy at one point. Uh, but now I, now I go in front of crowds and it doesn't, doesn't phase me one bit. Um, and so I would go teach these lessons and then different seminar companies and other groups like that heard of me and they would put me on and sometimes have quite large audiences. Like, uh, my largest was 500 people. So that that's being able to deliver a message. You know, you have a whole hour to speak. You can really deliver a huge message during that time and really get the word out. And then you have a lot of people who contact you or fill out a piece of paper and say they want to be contacted with what you kind of taught them to learn more or to get involved. And, and so that became a very effective way to reach out. And anytime you're on the stage, or in front of some people, or even on a podcast like this, it gives extra credibility to you. Uh, and people, people like seeing that and they like to get behind it. So the more you can get yourself out there when you're trying to raise money, the better, especially like letting people know what you do and how it's going to help them. So what have you found to be the best way to, to meet people, to meet those investors or potential investors? Um, well, those the cash flow club is about a third of, of where where my people come from. And that's you know, the meetup that you started where you were playing that game? Yeah, yeah. It's been going on for a decade now. So it's <laughs> it, wow. it uh, once a month, you know, I go for an evening. I I I play a certain way in the game that, you know, it's key. I I like to propose doing a joint venture within the game itself and see if the person is good to work with or not. <clears throat> and if, if they're good to work with, then I would like to invite them to a coffee, get to know them better and, and talk about actually doing something together. That's interesting. Uh, I've never heard, never heard that like testing the partnership with a game before actually, uh, you know, partnering up. That's interesting. Well, uh, it, uh, it reveals a lot. Pe people play based on their own money beliefs and so when you watch them play, uh, you know, if they're keeping their money close or hiding it or, uh, you know, tuck some out to the side, you know, that's what they're going to be like in real life. You know, if they're, if they're tucking money to the side, they have some type of savings. It's probably not doing anything. Uh, and, and some of it they might, might want to get working. You know, it doesn't always mean all. Everyone has a different comfort level. And I don't recommend someone use all they have. But at the same time, you can't have it sitting. <laughs> so what are outside of that meetup now, what are some other ways you found uh, to, to meet investors or potential investors? Well, uh, those, those very types of presentations where I go 
go in front of a room of, of uh, other real estate investors usually. Uh, if a meet, if another meetup group is big enough, I'll do that. I, I did that a couple weeks ago. Uh, I drove a little bit and there were 60 people in the room and, and there is 100% already four people that I'm doing business with as a result of, of doing that. So it was, it was very effective and there could be some more that come from it. We'll, we'll see where that goes. You know, I, I need to create some more opportunities right now because right now there's lots of people from doing these presentations that want in on these. And, uh, and, and the same thing, like, like today it looks like we're going to pay off about $400,000 of, of debt. It's debt for, for, for the company, but if for, for somebody else, it's like uh, it's like a loan for them where their money's going to grow by that rate. And so they love having it out. So I, my job is now I got to find a new, a new good opportunity for them to place that uh, because right now these are all people who have done this more than once with me and I'm pretty confident that they'll be into doing it for, for another cycle of, of whatever deal I can go find. Nice. So John, you've obviously been very successful at raising capital and what, what do you tell somebody that, that comes to you and says, you know, John, I really want to get into this type of business. I really want, I know you're, you're teaching, uh, you know, numerous people or lots of people and giving these classes and, but what do you tell them about raising capital? How, you know, how do they get started? Uh, well, what I like to tell people is, is you need to have, a, a certain appearance, you need to, to make sure you appear correctly, and that means professional. Um, there's, there, there, I do have a bunch of tips on those. Uh, there is like even studies, clean-shaven men are more trustable than men with a beard. It's just a study. Uh, I was always clean-shaven for Taekwondo, and I've always just kind of kept it up, and, and it's served well over the years. Uh, little things like that, anything to improve your trustability factor. Uh, but when I when it comes down to meeting with someone, I use a couple of the same lines every time I go to that coffee meeting, which is really where the magic happens because usually at that point in time, they've seen me either at a presentation, uh, maybe seen some videos of mine. A couple of people have contacted me from my YouTube show, which is uh, just something I started in January, so it's just kind of growing. Uh, but people have, uh, that has worked and people have reached out wanting wanting to lend from that and so they need a certain number of exposures and when I meet them or I get their email address at the cash flow game or after a presentation I will then email them a series of emails and that that's on autopilot and so those go out to them and they get to watch some videos and learn some new things uh, it shortcuts a lot of what I need to do so I try and have my my prospects get educated and I want them to make informed decisions and so I will give them a whole bunch of information uh, sometimes I charge them for it and make it a little bit of a course because that you know if they pay for it they value it and they're gonna they're gonna learn it which which is always nice so sometimes giving it away for free doesn't always work uh, but you know I'll, I'll discount it to, to the cheapest denomination so long as there there's some type of exchange like that and, and then at the same time, I can see whether they're going through it. I know whether they're getting educated. And, and what that does is it shortcuts <clears throat> the amount of time that I need to spend teaching them. So I can do an hour-long presentation, put them into the training course. Uh, several people will graduate from it. Uh, and then, and then they're, they're much more approachable. Uh, usually a phone call, sometimes only a phone call. Uh, but often going and having that coffee meeting with them and then having a very structured coffee meeting. But it's basically where I can meet them once or twice or three times. They get a whole bunch of, I call it nurturing. They get a bunch of, you know, hearing my voice, seeing my videos, uh, where they start to, you know, get my emails. And so they, we start to develop a little bit of a relationship that way. And then by the time I come in to go for a coffee meeting, they're informed, they're educated. Um, there's likely a good chance they're going to say yes to what I'm proposing. And it shortcuts the amount of teaching time I need to have. You know, when you, when you get together with a buddy and you're like, hey, here's a good idea and you start going through it, it can take hour after hour after hour. And so I'm, I'm shortcutting that so that I can get the message out and have lenders that, that know what they're doing and want to get into it. 
What, what's the hardest part right now in the whole capital raising process for you? Is it on, you know, on the back end of it now, you know, maybe answering those questions after the deal has been, you know, or is closed or is it still raising, you know, part of the capital as it's needed? Where's that at? Um, it's really finding more, more outlets to be able to, to speak on, to talk on and to do presentations. Uh, you know, teaching these courses that I do also helps a lot because it positions me as a, as a teacher. So people come to me to learn either how to do it the way I do it, or they come to me to want to lend. And that usually means lending to me. Uh, and if they want, I'll help them lend to their friend or, or something like that too, because there are, there are lending rules and so you should follow them. Uh, but at the end of the day, it, uh, it brings a lot of people in and, and quite frankly, there's a lot of people who are unhappy with what they're currently getting. So, you know, I, I think anyone who wants to, to raise money needs to change their mindset and their mentality and see that what you have to offer these other people is actually helpful to them and that, that, you know, people need you and, and that you're doing a good thing for them. And when you do that and you come from a real genuine place and you know that that's what you're going to be doing for them, people will see that and they're going to want, they're going to want to get involved as well. So what, John, what's the number one thing that's contributed to your success? I would, I would say it's, it's having a high level of integrity, uh, really taking, taking a lot of those long time ago, Taekwondo tenants, you know, the, we had these five words, courtesy, integrity, perseverance, self-control and indomitable spirit. And I think it's by not only learning a lot of that from a young age, but then teaching that those same, those same character skills to, to others and really taking that on the inside and, and believing it and continuing to live my life that way. I believe that people see that and that because, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of people who aren't good to do this type of business with, uh, there are some crooks out there and everyone needs to be, be cautious. And so that's why, you know, people need to be properly informed. And I like having a piece of property behind uh, any money that's borrowed that always, that always makes me feel good uh, because that's something that, that these people should be provided with. Nice. So John, tell us one way that you've recently improved your business that maybe we could all apply to ours also. Uh, one way that I recently improved my business, and this is, this is actually something that I'd known for a long time, uh, and had done several times for different people and it's called having an accountability partner. And so I know some other people from my networking and they're different business owners. They might not be in real estate. They might be, we understand what each other do and what it means is, uh, and, and not everyone needs to do this daily. Although I, I recommend it because it really keeps you going, but it's having one person who you can call on, and you can tell them what you got done and what you're planning on getting done the next day. And you really have to focus on having absolutely one thing that you're going to start and finish. And then any other goals are secondary, but you have to finish that important thing. And, you know, if the day's getting on and you got distracted, you think to yourself, you got to call that person the next day and tell them why, why you didn't do it if you didn't do it. And that sometimes hurts too. <laughs> and so, you know, it, you just want to get your work done so that, so that you can achieve the goals that you're setting out to achieve. And so I'd done that with many people, usually for a year at a time. And I'd done that for many years when I was in different coaching and business programs. It was something that was recommended. And just recently I started doing it again. It had been a couple of years without and, uh, and having those feelings of needing to get something done uh, have happened and I just turn around and, and get the work done because sometimes life can be a little bit comfortable and we still have goals to achieve. So we have to get so much done, you know, every day. I like that. I, I don't think anyone's talked about having an accountability partner, especially on a daily basis. So, so you and this person follow up with a phone call every day? Yeah, absolutely. We, we touch base every day. Uh, usually either in the morning or in the evening because he's, uh, he's full time just in a different market doing pretty much the same thing as me. And uh, he doesn't have a job, but you know, we have schedules to keep, but we can make time when uh, most other people are busy to connect. 
and make nice. sure that happens. So before we have to go, give us a little bit, is that like a, a 30 second call or is that like, <laughs> cause I think this is a great idea. Uh, is that like a minute, a minute call or how do you all structure that? So, you know, it doesn't last an hour every day. <laughs> yeah, no, it should be, it should be five to maybe 10 minutes per person kind of at the most. So both of you could theoretically get the call done in about 10 minutes or 15 minutes because you, you know, you're just going to go over maybe my most important thing is getting some agreements ready and paying someone back because there's money sitting there that that's due to them. And, you know, and so I have to send it off and I say paying that guy off and doing this is my most important thing. And if I get a run around or get called, you know, this hot deal appears in front of me and I got to run off, I still need to get those done. And, uh, and even though it could all wait till the next day, it's still important that it gets done and, and that you take those loads off of yourself. So it can be just a few minutes saying what you have to get done and what you did do. I did this. Uh, you know, I got my new website going. Maybe it's something as simple as that. I got new headshots for, for a, a proper business card uh, or for a website, you know, more than, more than just with your camera phone or, or whatever, however you're going to present yourself. Uh, you know, you're, you're working on some sort of thing. You know, I, you set up some automated emails that that go out to people like, like every time I would meet someone at a networking event, uh, I had this, I had this app and, uh, actually don't use it anymore. But what it does is you take a picture, but you can do this as well. Uh, take, you know, contact, put all their contact info down and then you can have little apps and programs and there's all kinds of free ones and paid ones. And I, I use a paid one. I'm not fully happy with it, but I'm still using it right now. So I'm not going to, I'm not endorsing it, but any type of little thing like that. And I could tag people in that system. And what it would do is it would do some of the follow up by automation. Like it would say, it was great to meet you uh, last night at the so-and-so event. Uh, here's some things I'm going to add you to my newsletter. Uh, and that's another thing that's been, that's contributed to a lot of success is I write a once a month newsletter. And I just put stuff in it that I'm doing. I, I, uh, I never thought I'd be much of a writer, uh, but here I am writing this newsletter every single month and sending it out. And my writing's gotten a little better over the years, but I've been doing that for over a decade as well. And it's amazing what people who you met at something have been opening your emails and then, and that's developing a relationship with them after even a little thank you. And then once a month, I'm not being spammy. And it's usually something about what I've been up to business wise. Uh, maybe there's an event I can encourage them to go to or meet up or see me at or, or something like that. And, and so I send that me those messages out and I don't abuse it. I, you know, I have a good open rate and I think people genuinely like, like receiving these mostly, mostly not everyone's going to be your fan, you know, <laughs> and if someone unsubscribes, I don't take it personally either. But, uh, but you know, oh, by doing that type of follow up at networking events, it develops a good sized database. And I have like over 4,000 people who receive this e these emails from me. And sometimes people are not always ready to lend and to, and to make that sort of commitment when they first meet you. But it's easy to forget about that first meeting. And every month, at least if I'm in their inbox, even my name appears, even if they just delete it and they open the odd one and don't even read each one, Sometimes years go by and then all of a sudden they reply to this newsletter, comes right to my own email address because I'm the guy writing it. And, and, and you never know what people say. I've had people write to me after years of not actually speaking, uh, but they're following me to a little degree. And they've said, John, I'm getting this inheritance. We need to talk. Uh, or this is happening. I'm, I'm selling this. I need to talk with you. Some, sometimes it's a, maybe an older person who has done a lot of deals themselves, but they're trying to take less work and responsibility on, and they're trying to do things a little more passively with the money they've made throughout their life. So, you know, that can, you know, that baby boomer who's at that stage uh, can all, can also come to me. He's receiving a payout from something. And I have, I have this one guy, he's got, got white hair, super nice. He's done multiple, multiple deals 
and has the ability to fund multiple deals of mine. He's a, a good, I'd say a fairly deep pocketed lender. And, uh, and he, he used to do all these things when he was younger. So I can talk to him for 20 minutes or 30 minutes, give him my pitch, keep it fairly simple. I, I already know what sort of due diligence items he's going to ask me for. So I make sure they're ready so that I make good use of his time. And, and typically he says, yes, he, he'll go look into that stuff. He'll even verify the, the evidence I'm showing him. Maybe it's an appraisal or some type of report or plan. And, and he's quite experienced, but I, I really like when he says yes, because it also means that I have a guy who's done this a lot and he sees what I'm doing and he believes in it at the same time. So that's awesome, John. Thank you for explaining that. And would you tell the, tell the listeners how they can learn more about you and, and your business and your YouTube channel? Absolutely. So uh, they can always go to my website. It's John Simcoe. That's spelled J O N S I M C O E dot com. Uh, and there I have a bunch of free and some paid courses about, about the different uh, real estate education that I teach. Mainly, uh, mainly I do a syndicated mortgages course. It's called RRSPs into real estate. Uh, for, for the American listeners, that's that's uh, just like your 401ks. It's just like uh, it's a registered fund. So, you know, it's one of those tax-free retirement accounts. And so I teach an account, uh, a course. The same information works for, for in America. I have looked into it. So if you guys are interested, there's that RRSPs into real estate. Uh, I should really make an American version. It wouldn't be a whole lot different to be totally truthful, but it covers everything about what to say in those coffee meetings at, uh, all the way through to how to present it so that you can get more clients in your business. And it was an evolution of five years that went into making that uh, from doing these presentations. So there's a lot of value. And if anyone wants, they can go over to J-O-N-S-I-M-C-O-E.com. Uh, they can grab it there. Uh, and, and so that's one way. My newsletter is at the very bottom of that same website. You can sign up for that. It's totally free. You can see the information that I'm sending to my people. Uh, you can reply to it. You'll get, you'll get directly a hold of me. And then you can also look up John Simcoe on YouTube. And I got a show on there called The Dealmaker Show, where I talk with other real estate investors about the types of deals they're doing. And it often focuses around how we're raising this money to be able to do these deals. So, you know, how to dress is, is uh, one of the episodes, et cetera, et cetera. So please go see the YouTube channel drop me a like and a subscribe. It's something that I'm trying to grow and, uh, and let, and feel free to comment and I'll, I'll reply to them because there's not a whole lot of people there and I'm trying to get some more over there. I think you guys would really enjoy it. You know, they were shot professionally and uh, I put some money and in, in effort into just putting this show out there. So go, go check out the YouTube show. Nice. Thank you so much, John. And I hope the listeners will connect with you and follow you on YouTube and learn a lot. And uh, we'll definitely have that in the show notes as well. I hope the listeners will go to lifebridgecapital.com and connect with me also and schedule a call so I can help you any way I can. And also join our Facebook group so we can all learn from experts like John and ask questions and grow our businesses together. And we will uh, talk to all the listeners tomorrow. Thank you for listening to the Real Estate Syndication Show, brought to you by LifeBridge Capital. LifeBridge Capital works with investors nationwide to invest in real estate, while also donating 50% of its profits to assist parents who are committing to adoption. LifeBridge Capital, making a difference, one investor and one child at a time. Connect online at www.lifebridgecapital.com for free material and videos to further your success.